My involvement with Hell Comes to Frogtown began when uh, a friend of mine, Don Jackson, came up to me and uh, he was the director of the film originally. Uh, I believe he's credited as a co-director now. And uh, he was writing a script about mutant frogs and he asked me, hey, would you be interested in making frog creatures? And of course, frogs are like my favorite animal. So I said, of course I'll make the frogs for you. Um, and then uh, I started designing them and he approved all my designs and then I gave him a budget and he came back and go, can you do it for $12,000 instead, and which was nothing. And I said, um, well, no, but sure, I can do it. So, just because I wanted to do the project. And so I just, that's how I got involved, started building it. Damn for me! The only dance I'm gonna do is to dance on your grave! Dance or die! From what I remember of the first day on set, um, it was pretty chaotic, like any, any movie was. Um, I don't remember so much of the first day on set as so much the first time that our frog worked. And we had built an uh, animatronic Commander Toady head for the scene where Sandal Bergman's doing the, the dance of the three snakes. And uh, that was a fun scene to shoot because Brian Frank was Commander Toady and he was just really great in the costume and just acting like, you know, really flamboyant and stuff. And, and, uh, and we had a lot of fun just puppeteering it and just making this frog come to life, you know. And as with any set, when you put it, bring an animatronic head and you, start, you fire it up and the director's always like, more, 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 bigger face movement, bigger, you know. So we, so we did, I think we probably overdid it, but it, it was kind of fun. The way I approached the creature design was, in the script, Commander Toadie had four arms, and that was a big surprise in the story. And, you know, Don had told me basically he wanted to do Planet of the Apes with frogs. So um, what actually inspired the design work was there was an episode of Spectre Man, it's a Japanese superhero TV show that came out in the 70s, that I was really uh, into because there was a whole little village of frog people in it. And I just thought that was just the most amazing looking thing. And they were a little crude back then, but they really inspired me. So I wanted to do sort of a modern, more realistic version of that. So using that kind of as a basis, a starting point, that's how I designed all the frogs. I'm a huge fan of all the Japanese superhero stuff and, and monsters and, and the classic universal, you know, um, monsters. This one, I didn't quite see it. I mean, aside from the, the fact that I was inspired by, by you know, Spectre Man, the frog people in Spectre Man, uh, this one was, you know, I didn't even really see it as a monster movie. It was, it was kind of a, a, a kind of a, a comedy. Well, I mean, it was a comedy, but it was kind of a sexual comedy, you know. And uh, and I think part of, part of that is what I think made it a lot of fun because no one took anything serious on set. They're there to try to make a fun movie and have a good time doing it. <laughs> All the actors that I worked with, Brian Frank, the guy who played Bull, everyone was fantastic. So like t tolerating the heat and the masks. Um, the girl, uh, Christy, who played Arabella, she was fantastic. You know, and I was kind of sad to see that she didn't have much of a film career uh, after that. But she was a, a fantastic actress. You know, we put her in the makeup, and she just worked it, and, and she was really good in it. You know, so. Um, but yeah, no, no crazy Hollywood, you know, actor tear the makeup off because they had enough kind of stories. It was just, it was a really fun family atmosphere and, you know, everybody had a good time. <laughs> this is one of our frog heads. Uh, this is a secondary frog head. We have, the, the primary frog head was Commander Toady. And Commander Toadie was a full animatronic mask, and uh, we had radio control that does his eyes, eyelids. He had lip movements, you know, jaw, and all that stuff. These ones were because of the budget. We built them with a, a skull cap and basically a simple cable mechanism, so that it, when the actor put it on, we strap it to his head. He can open the mouth with his own mouth movement. That's how we did that. And then inside here, you can see the little hole. 
that's what the actor's eyes register. We saw, he saw through here. And then we had little air bladders in here as well. And then we have somebody off screen with a little um, ear syringe things, and we just squeeze bulbs. We squeeze them, and they would just kind of move. And because we didn't have any money to make the eye movement on these guys, this, this character was wearing like uh, goggles, you know, and a fez. So, but, you know, it had minimal, minimal movement, but, you know, what really brought the character to life was the actor. The actor really injected so much character into it. So, that's how these worked. I'm, su this is, I'm surprised this is holding up. This is 25 years old. It, it gets hot in there, but it's not so bad because it's only a mask. And they don't really touch the foam latex so much because everything keeps it off of their face. <laughs> A noble gesture, Mr. Helen. You see it so rarely these days. The way that Don became co-director was kind of uh, interesting, maybe not that interesting. It's probably very typical of Hollywood. Uh, power struggles. Uh, when Don approached me to do the film, he had a budget of $200,000. It was going to be very low budget, he's going to shoot on, on 16 millimeter. And uh, then somehow New World took an a interest in the film and decided to raise the budget for $1.5 million. And at that point, there was bigger money at stake and they weren't comfortable with Don just being as the main director because of his track record of only making really small directed video films. So they brought in another director, R.J. Kaiser, who's, I guess, known for uh, being an editor and, and also an a ADR director. So they, uh, when he came in, the dynamic kind of changed. Um, and a lot of people that Don had brought in, I, I noticed, started to kind of disappear off set. You know, one day I'll show up on set and such and such was not there anymore. And I was like, what's going on? Finally, I went up to Don and go, Don, what's going on? You know, everybody's kind of gone. And he says, yeah, they're kind of... They're kind of pushing me to second unit, and then they're firing everybody that I brought in, you know, except for you. Which I later found out that they were trying to fire me as well, but before they did that, they went around town and was getting bids from all the other effects companies to see uh, if they can do the job for less money than I was doing it. And I was doing it for practically free. And so, of course, the, I think the lowest, I heard later, the lowest bid that they got was four times what I was doing it for. So this was all going on behind my back, and I, I had no knowledge of it. Um, I was just having a great time on set, you know, shooting the frogs, and, and I got along great with everyone, the, the, um, the first AD especially, which is always sort of the, the public enemy. Everybody hates the first AD because he's, he's such a dick, you know. Can I say dick? <laughs> but, um, so I got along great with everyone, and then at the end of the show, I remember the executive in charge of production came up to me and says, Hey man, you did a great job. You know, I'm so glad because you know we were really worried. You know, with all the money that we paid you, and I was like, what money? <laughs> so it, it ended well. You know, at, at the end, they they appreciated uh, that. You know, I I did work hard and did a good job for them, and and sort of elevated their production at the time because I kind of brought something in that was that looked more expensive than what they paid for. If you want to live, run. Not you, Tony. We're going down together. I wasn't sure what, how Roddy got involved, whether or not it was the budget ballooning or it was because of his involvement that the budget ballooned. Um, but I just know that, you know, when, back in 87, I mean, 1.5 million is, I guess, considered a pretty good amount of money, even for a low budget film. So um, I just remember, you know, they wanted to bring Roddy in, but which I wasn't, I'm not quite sure exactly how that happened though because Don Jackson is a huge wrestling fan and he had made, uh, one of his first films he had made was a, a wrestling documentary which sold to New World and so it may have been his connection with the wrestling world, uh, I'm not sure but I remember one day on set um, Cindy Lauper came to visit and uh, so he, she came to visit the, the creature shop and I was showing her all kinds of frog stuff they were doing so there was definitely some tie-in with the, the wrestling world uh, Roddy Piper was amazing. That was his first film, and uh, you know my dad was a huge fan of Roddy Piper's, and so I, I didn't know much about Roddy at the time. But when I found out he was involved, I started watching the, the fights that he was doing, and I was like, "Man, this guy's a loud, obnoxious jerk!" You know, I was so worried about working with him on set. He showed up. That whole thing was just a front. That's just his character. He's playing character. He's one of the sweetest, humblest, nicest guys I've ever met. And uh, even for Father's Day, I told him my father was a huge fan of his. 
So uh, he, we, I took a photo with him when he picked me up over his shoulder and I was holding a Happy Father's Day sign from my dad, you know, and he signed it. It was awesome. Yeah, he's a great guy. Must have been all that fiber I ate when I was a kid. Yeah, you know, it's funny because I didn't really directly work with her so much. I was on set all, all the time when she was working, so she was always there. Um, I didn't have really much interaction with her because most of what we were doing, aside from, from the, uh, the Dance of the Three Snakes, she wasn't so much involved. So, you know, she was kind of a star back then, so she was doing her thing. But um, I just remember all the actors on set, were, they were very nice. You know, just really humble, very nice to everyone. Bastard! <laughs> Um, you know what, I was actually a little too young to care <laughs> uh, about the political commentary on the film. You know, uh, I was 21 years old at the time when I, made, when I did this. And so, you know, back in that age and back in living in a world of just making monsters, I just kind of took everything at face value. Like, oh, here's this goopy monster about a guy who gets to impregnate all these women. Boy, tough job, right? So I didn't, I didn't really get into all that stuff, and, and sometimes I think it's, it's healthy for me to not get involved in thinking too deep about some types of movies, I think. You're letting them get away. I want you to do something about it now! As far as the release of the film and the marketing, um, I didn't really see much. You know, I, I saw the typical poster they put out, the, the AFM, the film market and whatnot. But I don't think this ever came out in theaters here in the U.S. It came out straight to, to video, and uh, so it was. You know, I guess it was one of the one of those direct-to-video movies, and uh, just kind of came and went. I don't think too many people noticed it. Um, I did see a few reviews on it, and most of the reviews that I've seen were favorable. People thought it was a really fun, you know, interesting concept. Uh, they had fun watching it, and a lot of times they'll, they'll comment on the frogs, and they thought the frogs were pretty cool. So. You know, that was enough for me. Back, th like back in those days, I think all I cared about was not so much the films. It was more like, how did my work look? You know, I'm make sure I'm trying to build a name for myself and just trying to make sure that the stuff I was doing was at least looking good. I'm not sure if the film helped my career or not. Um, I certainly didn't hurt it because all the reviews that I've read are all favorable you know, comments about the frogs. Uh, at that time that I was doing Frogtown, I just finished Predator. So Predator had just come out while we were still shooting. And that was kind of the big life changer for me at that time. Because when that, when Predator came out, and because of my involvement with building it for Stan Winston and stuff like that, um, it was, I was getting literally like two job offers every other day, it was crazy. Eat left, froggies. For me, there wasn't much difference going from a big budget to a low budget. Uh, you know, I, I just enjoy working on films. And uh, what was the most important for me at the time was, you know, aside from just working with really nice people and, and meeting nice people, there's, there's always jerks here and there. But for the most part, people are generally very nice. Um, I think the, the biggest thing that, that at least in my mind frame at the time, was just getting to work on movies was just so exciting already that it didn't matter if it was big or small. It was still a movie. One of, one of the, my biggest things about moving to Hollywood was, and I tell this to people, it doesn't matter whether or not I'm involved. What's important is that I know right now somewhere in Hollywood somebody's making a movie. And to me that was exciting. So that was kind of my mind frame. <laughs>